All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, by looking at my screen, it looks like everyone is being uh, being ushered into our, our audience. And so thank you for waiting and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, we're really, really glad you're all joining us today. I uh, Just very briefly, I, I am Creighton Drury and I have the great honor of uh, of serving as the CEO for Partnership to End Addiction. Uh, and I am particularly pleased today to be, I think, playing the role of uh, introducer and facilitator on this really important um, topic and conversation. You know, in a second, I will introduce um, our, our guests and friends, Kevin Sabet and Linda Richter. I say guests, but they're almost, you know, we talk so often that it feels like we're, we're in this work day in and day out. But this is a, a, a big, important and timely conversation. And Kevin has uh, recently released his book. And so we were just excited to bring everyone together to share and, and talk more. You know, the title for our discussion and our conversation is Smokescreen, What the Marijuana Industry Doesn't Want You to Know. And uh, it happens to be uh, the name of, of Kevin's book. And uh, we'll get into that in a minute. I just wanna briefly also welcome all of you who are here and I'm sure we'll have some joining us over the next few minutes. Uh, I know in a lot of people, a number of you who are part of our community partners network are with us and we're glad you're here. Um, as I mentioned, my name's Creighton and uh, Partnership to End Addiction. Um, I think mo many of you know us, but for those who, who may not, um, we're a national nonprofit organization. Um, we are focused on the issue of addiction. You know, our, our, our mission and purpose is to help families and other uh, caring adults uh, prevent and treat addiction and support recovery for their children and their loved ones. And through that work and using our research and policy and TA expertise, we're really, um, working hard to be in a position to uh, have impact and make a difference on this issue in the country and in whatever way we can. We all know how important it is. And um, we have just a, a terrific team, um, who, you know, who uh, do this work day in and day out and many great partners like yourselves. And so, um, so thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, uh, quickly, uh, we're going to get right into the discussion. Um, I, I'll introduce Kevin and Linda in a second, but in terms of um, our format uh, for this afternoon, um, I put together some questions. I'm gonna ask Kevin and Linda that really I think kind of get to the heart of the matter and have them do a lot of the talking. Uh, um, but we also wanna leave an opportunity for questions. And so as we go through um, the next uh, half hour, 35 minutes or so, um, if you have a question or thought or something you want us to try to respond to, we're gonna leave the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, for Kevin and Linda to field any questions that you might have. And so you can do that by simply typing um, your question into the chat. Uh, Marsha and, and Liz, who I think many of you know are also on the call with us. And at the end, they'll help us to um, identify and maybe group together some of the questions that we're getting so we can finish the, um, the hour together um, as constructively as we can. And so, uh, uh, and I believe everyone um, uh, will be on mute for this so that we can maximize, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the sound on this, but, um, but we'll make sure that we give voice to your questions if you use the chat function. And so uh, thanks in advance for that. Um, so just jumping right into it, I, you know, I kind of introduced them already, but I, uh, I've got these great impressive bios for both uh, Kevin, Dr. Sabet, and Dr. Richter. But for those who do not know them, let me just begin by introducing Kevin. Uh, as I mentioned, a good friend and partner to us. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Smart Approaches to Marijuana, uh, a nonprofit organization that he founded with uh, former representative Patrick Kennedy uh, and David Frum. Um, this is where we were talking about this before. He's been dubbed by NBC News as a prodigy of the drug politics and by Salon as a quarterback of the new anti-drug movement. Um, but he's, he's an author, a consultant, an advisor to three US presidential administrations and an assistant professor who has studied, researched, uh, written about and implemented drug policy for more than 20 years now. And as we've talked about his book and he'll talk about this more, I think in the, in the, in the discussion, his book, Smokescreen, You went on I have no idea how that happened. Uh, it goes to the machine. Um, uh, and so we're really glad, Kevin, that you are with us and we'll, we'll be getting into this conversation uh, in a moment, but also really glad to introduce my colleague and, uh, and also prodigy in her own right, uh, Linda Richter. Uh, she's the vice president of research and analysis for the Partnership to End Addiction, uh, where she oversees our prevention oriented research projects. Linda's work focuses on understanding the nature, scope of predictors and consequences of substance use and addiction, especially among young people. She leverages this research to help raise awareness 
uh, among parents, educators, health professionals, and policymakers about addiction science and best practices in substance use prevention and addiction care. Um, and so welcome to both of you. We couldn't have two uh, better experts to, uh, to engage in conversation. If this goes well, I'll ask questions, but then the two of you can start asking each other questions as well, and, uh, and we'll get into it. But, let, but let's see how we go. Um, Thank you. Let's just, let's just start here. Trev, you know, let me start with you. Congratulations on uh, the book. Um, and I'm tempted Thanks. just to say, tell us all about it. I, I've read most of it. Um, I just find it really um, com compelling in so many ways that I, I hope to get into. But maybe let's just start with um, talking about THC and the marijuana of today. Um, you know, there, you hear a lot about how marijuana and THC is not the marijuana that, that we knew a couple of generations ago. Um, you hear about it being more potent, uh, but your book, you know, gets into some other variables around that. Just share a little bit more about what that looks like today and, and what we need to know as we, um, you know, engage in the conversation. Sure, sure. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Creighton. Thank you, Dr. Richter, for being here, and uh, Liz, Marsha, the whole gang, Emily, at the partnership. Uh, just it's been incredible colleagues and friends. Um, really an honor to know all of you and the incredible your work you're doing, you know, across the spectrum uh, of these substances, uh, because, you know, we know that obviously substance use disorders are multifaceted, uh, complex, and you all are, are disentangling that for, you know, people that need help and, and especially parents and those who really are suffering with this illness and those who are working to prevent it. So, so really hats off to all of you doing this and Thank you so much for inviting me to, to promote Smokescreen and really just to have a, a nice talk with some of your community leaders. And it's great to see so many of you on. You know, when I, I, I wrote this book, um, it, was, it was something that, that actually was a very sort of a uh, long work in progress. Uh, it wasn't something, you know, when I left the Obama administration in 2011, uh, 10 years ago, which is really hard to believe, it's pretty amazing. Um, I wrote a book then that some of you, and, and it's great to see a lot of friends here. I even got a couple chats from some of your partners there who I didn't realize would be on. It's wonderful to see so many of you, Scott and, and, and many others. Um, you know, many of you kn knew I wrote a book called Reefer Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. And I wrote that very, very quickly when I left the Obama administration, um, really just as a way to sort of get something out there fast based on the science, really almost a fact book um, myths and facts uh, of marijuana. One of them is about the THC content, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, and and it, you know, I, I thought it went well. This book was very different. I'm actually a lot more, uh, I'm a lot prouder of this book because this one is something that reads a little bit more like a story because I was essentially a couple of years ago, um, I had in, you know, in quick succession, several people approach me that you know their stories were just too good uh and their experiences i just kept hearing all across the country really all around the world and i felt like it, it needed to be in a book and that's what smokescreen is about so it's about different different facets of this issue it's about the industry that is unfortunately many of which are corrupt many of whom come from the tobacco industry from the alcohol industry they come from industries that we've learned we can't really trust and the idea that we would be you know giving them the keys to the kingdom on marijuana I mean, it makes absolutely no sense, but it's also a story of a loss and heartache of, of parents and young people who really uh, were dumbfounded by this push to normalize marijuana, thinking marijuana was relatively harmless because it was, you know, isn't it like the marijuana of the past and really being burned by this industry, being promised so much and actually being hurt. Uh, so some of it's about that. Some of it's about also my, my sort of my, my personal journey in this whole thing. I, I got involved in prevention, you know, when I was a teenager, but, um, you know, at the centerpiece is this idea that, you know, these products are not as safe as they're, to, as we we're told they are, they are. And a lot of the reason for the fact that they're not safe is because of the THC content you touched on Creighton. So the fact that we have old marijuana, I call it and new marijuana, the old marijuana is the three to 4%, you know, smoked, um, you know, in a joint that, you know, was passed around in college or whatever. And then new marijuana, which is the, you know, up to 99% THC. Uh, in fact, I, someone just texted me. They, they said, Kevin, have you seen this picture? It just won the best, you know, they have all these contests. It, it won the best marijuana, uh, number one uh, THC product. And I'll show it on the screen here. I didn't plan for it, but it's now that it's come up. Um, I don't think many people would recognize this as marijuana. I mean, it looks like 
crystal or something that you cut a diamond from, right? I mean, this is not your, you know, marijuana of the past. And a lot of this book touches on that and some of the harms uh, that, that, that emanate from that as, as well. You know, and thanks, Kevin. And, you know, and you, you talk about um, the industry working hard to make it, you know, seem as if it's harmless. And you, know, you go into that in great depth. But, you know, we also know, you know, what the science is telling us. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there. And that's sort of at the heart of it, too. I mean, as you wrote the book and as you sit here today, what in terms of the harm um, that uh, today's marijuana can cause, what you know, what gives you greatest alarm? And, you know, what have you learned, you know, what did you learn in writing the book in terms of what people are saying to you about that? Well, it's interesting you're talking about the science because when I when I first actually wrote this book and I referred to a lot of studies, um, obviously that are there's a lot of studies in the book, um, the early editor uh, mentioned that, that I really shouldn't be putting uh, citations because, you know, that's not how general books are, are, are written. They don't have, you know, a whole thing of citations. This isn't supposed to be an academic book. And, you know, at first I thought, oh, okay, you know, you're the, you're in the, you're in the industry, you know, and then I thought about it and I said, well, no, the whole, one of the whole biggest problems we have is that people don't understand that there is a lot of science actually, um, you know, there's this myth that you can't study marijuana. There's it's actually been studied extensively. We should study it more, of course, but there's so much out there people don't understand. And because there's so much skepticism about the harms of marijuana, I, I insisted that there had to be citations, you know, whether or not that was a good look, or even if it would sell fewer books, it didn't matter to me. Um, there had to be citations because people don't, believe you um, and they don't believe that, and they don't know that every major medical association, you know, is concerned about marijuana. They all oppose legalization. They oppose the expansion and normalization. And there ended up being, I think, 350 odd references. So maybe it's a little overboard, but um, it's not meant to be a fact book, though. It's a, like I said, it's a book of these stories. And and yet I really felt compelled to do that. I think probably the stuff about harm that really still hits me hard is the stuff related to mental illness, especially suicidality. I mean, I, there are a number of stories in there that, you know, will break your heart about, um, you know, people's who's either pre-existing mental illnesses or, or they didn't have a pre-existing or even family history turned into something really, really dark and did not end well. Um, and, you know, high potency marijuana was a huge part of the picture. Did it cause all this stuff? Is sort of this question of causation versus correlation. You know, that, that's more difficult to, un, un, you know, entangle sometimes, um, disentangle. But generally, the fact that, you know, this stuff is so potent, it's affecting mental health in such profound ways. I think that probably touched me the most and even surprised me as someone who, you know, reads this stuff every day. Uh, when I heard these stories, and then I looked more and more and more and more at the scientific literature. Yeah. You know, and Kevin, as you say this, this is, you know, I didn't have this question jotted down, but as you're talking about mental health, um, and, you know, it's, it, and I know you, you talk about this in the book, you have a chapter or two to it, but just you can't help but thinking about the last year, you know, and what we've been through with the pandemic, um, and how that's affected so many Americans and so many kids and families across the country. I'm just, you know, curious, you know, if, yeah. you know, have you seen, has there been any change in the conversation or things you're talking yeah. about in the context of the last year? Well, it's interesting. I scrambled to grab this book from press to write a chapter about COVID because, you know, we were way into it and, you know, at the end of last year and, you know, it was sort of giving the publisher, uh, you know, a heart attack, but it was like, how could you not talk about <laughs> this global pandemic. So it's like literally stop the presses. I, I got, we got to talk because there, there, there's a lot of intersection. Number one, I think it says a lot about us as a society that we deemed marijuana stores essential as essential stores during a time of, you know, loneliness, isolation, uncertainty, you know, a time when things were really scary. I mean, we've all, I think, been touched by this pandemic. Um, I've lost people that I know, that I've known well. I, um, I mean, I, you, all, all of you have, and especially so many of you from New York as well, but everywhere. And, um, you know, this idea that, you know, recovery, we don't think of recovery as essential, but we think of something like marijuana as essential. Like that to me, the idea that we don't do everything we can to get people into recovery, get them help and prevent, which, you know, is the first thing we were doing, we should be doing. Um, but 
we're so concerned and consumed about, you know, how do we deliver marijuana during a pandemic? It, so that was just, an, I think, a very eye-opening thing. I think it says something about, you know, our society. It says something about what, um, you know, the historian David Musto from Yale, one of my mentors, um, used to talk about the American disease, the uniquely American disease, although other parts of the world suffer um, you know, there's countries in the Middle East that have higher rates of opioid use per capita than we do. But in terms of the history and the depth and the suffering and the extremism and the commercialism, this is a uniquely American disease, substance use disorder. And, you know, that just proved that to me right there. Um, the fact that you had the industry touting marijuana as a cure for COVID, which happened, uh, when in reality, there's one or two very isolated studies. And actually, many others that failed. You know, what's amazing about scientific research and, 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 and Linda, Dr. Richter can talk about this is there's a lot we don't hear about because it never makes it to, you know, it never makes it past peer review. There's something wrong with the study. There's something wrong with the research. And um, anyhow, but the fact that there were a few studies saying that components in marijuana, you know, created in a laboratory might help some people with symptoms related to COVID. I'm open to that. I mean, I'm open to anything that can help people with any of these you know, chronic illnesses or diseases or, or whatever. So that's fine. But the fact that there was such a media spotlight on that and that the industry would run with it, I think told us a lot as well. And the fact that this pandemic, um, you know, we, we have forgotten about the other epidemic, uh, you know, obviously with drugs and also the epidemic, not only with opioids and other drugs, but also with the e-cigarettes and the e-valley crisis that we were going through in 2019, which seems like a hundred years ago now that we've all lived through COVID. Yeah, no, absolutely, for sure. And, and yeah, Linda, let me bring you into the conversation now, too. And certainly if you want to follow up on anything Kevin just mentioned, but I would just begin, you know, Linda, you and I talk about this all the time. And, and Kevin, you know, I love the way you described, you know, how your book was meant to share stories as well as share facts and talk about how this is impacting people. And, you know, Linda, my, you know, my, my thoughts go to, you know, the parents that we work with and try to connect with and the questions that they're asking, right? It's the question that we, I think we've all heard, like, you know, come on, how, you know, how harmful is marijuana? You know, I, I, I did it, I knew people who did it, or alcohol is worse. Um, you know, what's your, what's your sense of that in terms of, um, you know, what do we say to those, to those parents, those adults who, who are in that space as they think about it, um, you know, given what Kevin's sharing as well? Yeah, I mean, I would acknowledge that perhaps alcohol is more dangerous overall, especially if you compare it to what Kevin referred to as the older marijuana. But the comparisons were still less obvious when you consider today's marijuana with its high potency, THC. But regardless of whether it's less dangerous or not, it really doesn't mean that we want to add another harmful substance to the mix. Um, you know, it's well known that the strength and potency of marijuana today is way higher than in the past. And especially the new ways of using it through concentrates and vaping make it much easier to use and to use it more frequently during the day without being noticed. So this is a parallel to vaping, nicotine vaping, where it became such an issue because, um, you know, if a kid wanted to smoke 10 years ago, people knew about it. Um, you know, unless they were hiding behind the AMP or whatever that is, um, you know, you could smell it, you could see it. Um, but with these sort of new discrete ways of using these products, it just became easier for young people to use it frequently throughout the day and in high doses and without people knowing about it. Um, so that means that younger people are ingesting fairly high doses of THC and the other toxic chemicals that are in these products, um, much more so than adults did when they were young, you know, smoking a joint. Um, and we also know much more now than we did then about the health effects of marijuana, especially its increased harm to kids whose brains and bodies, as we know, undergo rapid development well into their 20s. Um, and, and their brains and bodies could be severely harmed by any drug or alcohol or nicotine, and that includes marijuana. Um, and finally, I just add, even though this may not go over so well, that it's kind of impossible to say with certainty that people who used marijuana back in the 70s, 80s had no harmful long-term effects and that they did turn out just fine. Like, you know, some of the effects are kind of potentially subtle and they could reduce your academic or your career success or other life functioning. And uh, an individual might not be able to have identified that. So, you know, with all the effort we put into raising our kids and giving them every opportunity, we really kind of want to protect them from anything that would set that back, even if it's just in a little way. Yeah, yeah no, and I just, if I could just say real quick is that I absolutely agree. And uh, of course, I mean, the studies done that show 
you know, I mean, there have been studies for a long time. There's been studies done 20 years ago showing, you know, lower life satisfaction, lower academic results. I mean, that, that wasn't done with high potency THC. Those are looking at people who are actually using relatively low THC. That's why stuff like I showed from my phone that looked like, you know, crystal, I, we just have, we have no clue. It can't be good. Uh, and the early indications are, are that it's not good, but um, it's scary to think that the, the stuff that a lot of our research is based on is based on weaker marijuana than now. Yeah. Kevin, yeah, but just reminding me, I forget what the statistic was when I was reading it, but it was the 3% then concentrate versus like 99% now on, what was that statistic? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at, you know, THG that smoked from the past, you know, in, in a joint that was averaging 3%, 3 or 4%. And that's not like 70 years ago. That's like 20 years ago. I mean, that's not that long ago, uh, 10 to 20 years ago. Whereas now you can get these concentrates or sometimes they're called, you know, shatter or wax or dabs or whatever you want to call it. And it can be up to 99.9%. It's, it's advertised as such. And again, the, you know, the things that look like crystal that look, they're, they're clear, they're not even green or yellow anymore. I mean, it's literally like glass um, that can, you know, that's consumed and that's almost pure THC. I mean, given all this, Linda, I'd like to just come back to what you were saying too before. Um, you know, what's your advice in, for parents? And I know, you know, we talk about this a lot with our team internally, but but what can parents say, you know, be able to talk about this openly yeah. and honestly, um, you know, given all these, you know, um, dynamics and challenges, uh, you know, to the, to the, you know, the way this, you know, marijuana and this issue has evolved, you know, what, what, what can we say to parents about that and talk it to their kids? You know, I, I would think that um, using smoking and drinking as a model for how we address these risks is a, is a good way to go, explaining that the research clearly shows different and worse physical, mental, and academic effects for kids who use versus adults. I mean, I tell my own teenage kids, I have two of them, uh, how marijuana, like alcohol or any other drug, can really interfere with their goals and their current and their future success and academics and extracurricular activities. These are things they care so much about and are working so hard for. And, you know, why, why would you put these roadblocks in front of you? Um, another interesting take is something we learned from uh, smoking prevention, for what worked with kids. So teens are really adamant about their independence. Um, and what worked well with them um, to turn them against cigarette smoking was really learning about how the tobacco industry preys on kids' health just to make money. And when kids really understand that big industries are behind the legalization push and have life, you know, just trying to have lifelong loyal customers by targeting kids, kids can hear that um, and they can get upset from it. Uh, and it could shine a different light on the legalization efforts because their, their desire to kind of be rebellious and nonconformist. And then they kind of get this realization that actually you're doing exactly what the industry is kind of using you as yeah. puppets to do. It can, can be a turnoff. And that did work with smoking. And, and finally, um, you know, the parents often want to be their kids' friends. <laughs> and are wary about kind of setting some limits and expectations. And I, I would recommend clearly voicing your expectations that your child would delay use or not use at least until they're 21 because it's not legal and it's not good for them. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to have, you know, tremendous punishments or yell at them and all that, but just the expectations have to be clear. A lot of parents come across as sort of wishy-washy on this topic, which makes kids not really get how serious it is. Um, and these, these conversations are not easy to have, and there's many different scenarios. Um, but, you know, we have resources, others have resources to kind of help parents through this. Yeah. You know, one of the things, Creighton, if I can say, is that yeah, please, I think, yeah. you know, Linda is exactly right, rather than sort of didactically sort of talking down to kids, because they're smart, they're, this is the information generation, they can look up anything. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's very different than the past. Um, you know, telling them that, you know, listen, do your own research, but your brain is a dollar sign to this industry. It needs you to survive. Uh, it's the same way it needed our or older generations in terms of tobacco needing them to survive. It's the same thing now with marijuana and young people. So, you know, do what you want, but, but there are, there, there are boardrooms that are, have presentations in them relying on your brain and your generation's brain in order for them to have these lifelong customers. Because if you, you know, as Linda alluded to, if you don't use until age, you know, by 21 or so, you're unlikely ever to do so. And so 
Um, you know, that's super key to this. Um, you know, I think the other, the other example, you know, cause it's true. Parents are sort of like, well, I used it. And so can I say anything? I don't know. And what about alcohol? Um, you know, there are differences with alcohol and part of the reason alcohol is frankly more dangerous than most drugs we know of is because it's legal, right? Because it's used more the, the commercialization and normalization has made it kill more people than opioids. Now, on a one-to-one -one basis, we would never say that a you know a beer is more harmful than you know a fentanyl. We, we, we wouldn't say that. But from a macro perspective, from a from a societal perspective, um, alcohol is dangerous. A lot of which is because of its legality. And the same thing with tobacco. That's why we're moving to ban menthols. Um, we're not saying you know we're going to have a certain level of menthol allowed. We're saying no menthols because it's killing people. It's dangerous. And we know that, of course, some people will still get it. But when you ban it, you, you are less likely to, um, you know, have people use it because it's less available. And, and finally, I think young people, because they didn't live through tobacco, you know, the three of us probably remember when we would go to a restaurant, what's the first question we'd be asked when we entered the restaurant by a host? Smoking right? or not smoking. Exactly. Smoking or non. I mean, this is like, in, you know, in, ingrained in, 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 our, in our brains. Kids, anyone under 30 has no idea what we're talking about. Smoking or non is not a part of their reality because we had to take 80 years to learn the lesson that tobacco was probably a bad idea and that big tobacco was lying to us. And so, A, we don't want to get duped again. But B, I think a lot of young people don't know that about tobacco. They don't know that, you know, tobacco killed relatively few people until the early 20th century when we inserted nicotine and many other additives. And there was an industry that produced cigarettes, you know, for mass production. That's when cigarettes started killing people, not before. There, there, tobacco wasn't killing people as much before, not even not even close, like a, like a few orders of magnitude difference. I mean, it wasn't, it's not comparable. And so marijuana is the same thing. You know, what might be sort of a harmless plant and it's native, you know, THC with all the components, what is being sold today and what's around is a completely different drug manipulated by an industry that basically relies on addiction for profit. And I think talking about these history lessons with young people, as well as about lessons about PR and marketing and their brains, I think can, can be you know, just as, if not more effective than talking about the harms. Yeah, I think I, I mean, for sure when you make these comparisons and, and where we've been, it almost feels like it's deja vu all over again when we look at where we are today and, and you know, whether it's kids or why so many Americans, you know, seem to support it, you know, today. I mean, there's that big question. But I think given our time, I mean, Kevin, given where we are now, I mean, how do you approach or, 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 or how do we talk about regulation, you know, in terms of what exists mm -hmm. now or doesn't exist? And, you know, and, and, you know, if this is a reality for the moment, what should it look like? Yeah. You know, what, 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 do you talk about that in the book? Sure, I do. I mean, look, one thing is that in legal states, it's not being regulated well at all. We don't really know what's in it. Buyer beware, even if you're in California, Colorado, any of these legal states. It, I talked to an owner of a lab in Colorado, and I won't give it away because I'm hoping people will buy the book, but um, you know, they told me crazy stories about how they really don't know even what's in this product, about how the industry buys off the results. It's crazy. So we currently, we're not doing a great job. Now, there's even a question in here which sort of goes with it in terms of can we monitor the content? Right now, we're pretending to monitor the content in states, but we're not monitoring the content because we have no idea what's going on, number one. Number two, could you technically monitor the content? Yes. And so what we're trying to do is put potency caps, for example, in Colorado and some other states that have legalized to say, we don't need 99% potency. Let's put a cap. Let's have a certain level. And it doesn't mean that that level is safe. It just means that it's safer than 99% or anything higher un, above a certain threshold. So there are things like that. Um, there are things like advertising bans. There was a lawsuit um, that we supported in California, which banned billboards from highways, unfortunately. And again, this is kind of what we've been warning for 10 years, for a long time. Um, the industry just paid off some legislators and now they're going to legislate that you're allowed to do that. So even though we won in the courts, we're going to lose in the legislature because of the way money influences politics. So, you know, regulation is such a tightrope to, to, to walk. It's so difficult. You know, it doesn't mean that we're ignoring the reality. If marijuana becomes legal, of course, we're not going to put our head in the sand. We need to come together as a field and, and talk about and enforce 
you know, FDA regulations and really enforce what's out there. But, um, you know, right now we have a president who's not in favor of legalization. We have a divided Senate. I'm not as, you know, optimistic. This is going to just sail through in the next year. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. There's, you know, at least half a dozen Democrats in the Senate who are not really a fan. So, you know, I think this is still going to have a bit of a windy road until and if if we get there. Yeah, no, no, that, that makes sense. I mean, Linda, let me just kind of build on that question if there's anything you want to add. But also, you know, we've talked a little bit about your know, regulations and laws that could be designed to be protective of young people, um, you know, and lessons learned um, from other substances. You know, what, what would you add or share that can help us be as protective as possible in that sense? Yeah, so, you know, once a drug is legal, it's really virtually impossible to completely protect kids from its harms, given the inevitable increase in exposure and access. But there are some ways to hopefully minimize risk. Um, and it takes the public to really understand this and push for it. Um, and again, learning from tobacco, vaping, even alcohol, we have some ideas. So we need to really ensure that legalization is not fully equated with commercialization. Um, it's our country and Canada, basically, that's allowing that and nowhere else. I mean, countries where everyone assumes it's legal and available all over have fairly strict rules about um, advertising and marketing and allowing kids to get access to these products. So we're really kind of the only ones who are uh, behaving this way. But if, it, if I could design the, um, you know, provisions to protect kids, I would say marijuana sellers should not be able to at all advertise or promote their products in public spaces, on the radio, on television, in movies, and social media. Um, they should not be able to sell them in appealing, child-friendly packaging. Um, they should not be allowed to use flavors. They should not be allowed to sell edibles that look like candy or soda or sweets that kids could just grab a hold of. Um, they should not be allowed to have giveaways and contests and promotions as they did with vaping, which started this whole epidemic, and as they continue to do with alcohol. Um, there should not be dispensaries near schools or parks or any place where kids congregate. And as Kevin has said many times, we need caps on the THC potency um, in these products to prevent the increasing rate of childhood poisonings and exposures to these products um, and the high rates of addiction that are going to follow. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots that we can do. Um, Kevin, I'm sure you know have other ideas. Well, the, the other thing I was going to say is we shouldn't have the industry serving on the, the regulation boards in each state. I mean, right now, industry is infiltrating, and so they're trying to you know self regulate that, and that obviously doesn't doesn't help. Yep. Yeah, no, no, all, all great great points, and you know, Kevin, I know um, you know you touch on this um, in the book as well. But you know, what have you learned? What do we know about those who are consuming in the states? Um, consuming marijuana in the states that have legalized it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I think one of the, you know, the questions related to that, besides the industry, you know, are there others who are benefiting and profiting in ways that maybe we don't think of? We'd love for you just to share a yeah. little bit about that. Sure. You know, um, well, first of all, we know that the volume of marijuana consumed has increased dramatically in the U.S. in the last 10 years or so, especially in the legal states. So, um, you know, drug policy researcher Jonathan Calkins, who I, I recommend everybody check out, and he's agnostic about legalization. He doesn't, he's not a, doesn't take a point of view. He's a researcher. Um, and, you know, he talks about like, there's been 40 billion more hours of intoxication, which is an incredible way to measure it. Kind of, you know, disheartening if you think about it, but that's basically what there's been since legalization. Um, if you look at the price collapse in a lot of states, that has in, that has led to a lot of increases. So we've seen increases in almost every state among all populations, definitely among youth. There's a big misnomer that youth youth hasn't gone up based on some obscure state studies that don't look at some of the other studies that are out there. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's we're not going to know the full extent of the effects of this for 20 years. So I'm not one to say we already know all of the numbers are always going to be this way because it can always change. And, and, and a lot of things take a while to figure out. I mean, we don't know, you know, how long does it take to talk about, you know, school dropouts or, you know, mental illness things. I and mean, these things can sometimes take a while to manifest. So we have to kind of wait and see. Um, so we've seen we've seen a lot of that in terms of who benefits. I mean, unfortunately, again, there, I wish I didn't have to do this, but there's story after story in the book about different politicians that have benefited. Um, there are stories about businesses, um, you know, obviously big tobacco because they've invested 
billions. I mean, Lucky Strikes, Altria, Imperial Brands, billions into marijuana. The alcohol industry sees marijuana as an alternative product line. There's almost every major alcohol and beverage sort of company has some in some way gotten into marijuana, uh, some more than others. And then you have companies like miracle Grow. Uh, they were the ones that funded this in New Jersey and in New York because they see an, a, a market for them in terms of plants and growing and sort of hydroponic grows and things like that. So, you know, the, 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 we're, we're just seeing this over and over. And of course, there are a lot of lawyers benefiting. There are a lot of PR folks. There's, there's a lot of those folks too. Um, but we definitely have the billionaire class. A lot of them are invested in it. They see marijuana. And now, by the way, psychedelics and other drugs, because remember, it doesn't just stop at marijuana, unfortunately. Um, they see the a future in legalizing those and how they can get in on that. So there's a whole group of people that benefits. Unfortunately, it doesn't benefit young people. It doesn't benefit poor people. It doesn't benefit those with a use disorder. It doesn't benefit families. I mean, what family would ever say, if only, you know, my kid and my husband smoked marijuana, we'd be a better family. <laughs> it doesn't benefit them, but it benefits a lot of these other folks, unfortunately. Yeah, and we talk about, and Linda, you know, I, I, I hadn't written this down, but we've talked about this, you know, we've talked about what have we seen in terms of who's consuming the states that have legalized. Is there any evidence, uh, one or the other, that there is increased use among young people uh, in the states that have legalized, or is it inconclusive? I mean, what have you seen um, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to it quickly, but I know, Kevin, you have lots of stats in your excellent book. Um, but yes, uh, so in states that have legalized, so the perceptions of risk around marijuana have gone down uh, compared to states that have not legalized. And, and we know that that's a direct um, predictor of actual use. And there are actually higher rates of use in the past month, past year among kids living in states that have legalized. There's also um, higher rates of initiating or starting to use marijuana um, during the teen years between ages 12 and 17 in states that have legalized compared to those who, that haven't. Um, we're seeing higher rates of uh, marijuana use disorder, which is basically addiction um, in states that have legalized like Colorado compared to other states. So um, there have been studies that have, you know, given mixed messages, some saying, oh no, there's not really a difference. Um, when you follow that data farther out, um, you're, you're seeing higher rates of use among kids. Thanks for that. And, and Kev, you know, one of the other things too that, you know, I think we will we'll hear one of the arguments is that um, legalization actually will help because it'll, you know, you know mitigate or, or, or um, thwart the underground market, so sort of the illegal activity. Um, you sort of speak to that otherwise in your book. You know, what, what, what have you learned or what do you share in the book around that? Yeah, so for many years, and those, again, we have many of our own SAM affiliates and partners here, like Nancy and um, Julie and others, for, you know, they, they've heard me talk about how the underground market doesn't go away. Drug dealers don't just, you know, go to dental school when you legalize drugs. They undercut the legal price. They're able to sell still, um, you know, a state that's taxing it with certain and selling it in certain hours is no match for a you know, uh, entrepreneurial drug dealer willing to take risks and basically uh, still making a huge profit without ta needing to tax it. Uh, so, but but I, I've talked about that for a long time and, and it's been written about in the New York Times and other, you know, reputable outlets in all of these states, how the black market, the underground market is thriving. But I felt for this book, I wanted to go one step further. So I actually spoke to a drug dealer in Michigan uh, who told me about her story and about how she got to where she is. And it's, unfortunately, it's a sad background, um, which isn't surprising, it speaks to the larger issues of this, um, but, but really talked about how she got around legalization and how legalization helped her. Uh, and so, you know, again, they say sometimes um, you know, uh, statistics are just statistics, but stories are, are priceless. And so, you know, that's why, um, you know, I, I included her story in addition to the data we have on, on the underground market. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, and one of the other things I think it's, 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 you know, important to touch on too, one of the other arguments um, that we will hear is sort of what, what I see as the um, confusing of the issue of legalization uh, and decriminalization and how that, yeah fits into the racial justice um, uh, advancements and conversations that we are necessarily having as a country. And Kevin, I forget how you described in the book, but it was something along the lines of, you know, 
you know, um, opposing legalization, you know, does not mean you're not supporting decriminalization. Maybe just expand on that a little yeah. bit, share your views on that. Linda, I'd love for you to jump in on that too, if you have yeah. other thoughts, because this is such an important issue when we start, I think, try, talking about bringing clarity to this issue and what it means or doesn't mean. So I think there's been a false dichotomy that has said you either have to legalize or criminalize, incarcerate. So you either have to normalize it, commercialize it, or, you know, uh, have a war on drugs and put people in prison or give them a criminal record or arrest people. That is a false dichotomy. You don't have to do either to have smart marijuana policies. And so, unfortunately, the marijuana industry has purposefully obfuscated and, and confused and conflated the term, which are the terms which are very different from each other legalization, which is about, you know, like alcohol, it's promotion, it's selling, it's marketing, because that's American style legalization, and decriminalization, which is maybe how we would treat somebody driving 10 miles over the speed limit or speed or, or um, jaywalking, something that's not going to put you in prison. It's not going to give you a criminal record or even any record, depending on what it is, but, you know, would be something that isn't also going to be promoted. Uh, it's not going to be something that's going to be, you know, commercialized and promoted. So, um, those are two very, very different things. And so, you know, we have championed decriminalization measures to remove the criminal penalties. We don't want to treat people and stigmatize them. We don't want to treat them, you know, with a, in, in a harsh way. But how do we, you know, prevent, discourage? That's what we should be do. That's what we should do. Um, and, and how do we, um, you know, not give people criminal records? recognize social justice issues. But, you know, for those who are really interested in criminal justice reform, of which I am, um, you're barking up the wrong tree with marijuana because there are so many other issues. And again, marijuana is distracting. In fact, it's a huge opportunity cost, I think. When we talk about marijuana, we're not talking about the 20 other issues in criminal justice reform that would actually send fewer people to prison, have fewer people you know, arrested and, and given records. Um, but again, in, in this country, we've had that false dichotomy. And, and for those who say, well, we can, we can always legalize it, but without commercializing it, um, I'd love to see an example of where that's ever been done in our country. I, it's never been done. Uh, we have the First Amendment. We have free speech, among, especially among corporations. That's why the billboard stuff is almost impossible to win these days. Um, you have for-profit companies writing the laws and passing the laws, paying the politicians, lobbying. So yes, in theory, I could maybe create a legalization policy that basically was like, okay, we're gonna have like personal use or we're gonna have, you know, whatnot, but we're not gonna have the promotion. We're not gonna have the, you know, the, um, the, the commercialization or lobbying. You can write it down and, and, and it may look okay, but I've never seen that implemented in the US. So I'm very skeptical of people who say, well, we can, we can have legalization and just kind of, it'll be a little bit kinder and gentler. I, I, I just, I've never seen us be able to do that as a country, unfortunately. Yeah, and I would just add that I think I think you mentioned this, Kevin, but I think it's quite purposeful how the you know decriminalization legalization um, stances have been obfuscated by the industry. Um, so kind of painting anyone who's against legalization as a racist um, when and you have in your book so many examples of how um, in states that have legalized uh, it, it actually affects. Um, disadvantaged communities, minority communities dispropor disproportionately um, in terms of where the dispensaries are, in terms of police activity there, regardless of the legalization status. Um, it's just such a nuanced, complicated uh, issue that to just paint it with these broad strokes of, you know, being anti-legalization is racist, being uh, pro-legalization is social justice is just really missing a ton of information. Well, and look at who's making the money from legalization. I mean, they're people that look like us, frankly. Yeah. They're not others. And um, they're the ones profiting from it. Of course they are. They're the ones with the capital, the connections, the, 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 the ability to, to navigate this, this business, to get the loans. So it's, it's, it's not surprising, but it's very sad because I've also seen, you know, communities think, oh, this is the way we're going to lift up. And then the smarter people, the wiser people in the community say, wait a minute, when have drugs ever helped us? You know, there's a liquor store in every corner, but there's not a good school. What does that say about where marijuana is going to go? Are we going to somehow magically get it right this time? Like it just, I, I maybe I'm just too cynical, but I, I don't see how that would work. Yeah, I mean, thank you both for that. I mean, such an important part of this conversation. 
Um, we have 15 minutes left and we do want to leave. Uh, I've been trying to follow the chat. I know Marsha and Liz have been, and maybe we'll give them a moment to um, kind of compile any questions they have uh, they've gotten, or if anyone hasn't had a chance yet you know, to, to submit a question, please do so. But while we do, I want to take a, a minute or two, Kev, I'd love for you, if there's anything you haven't had a chance to talk about um, with regards to your book that you would want people to know, including sort of where to get, where to get the book, um, I'd love for you to take a minute or two to do that now. And Linda, I'll ask you a similar question about our resources, and then we'll, we'll take some time for some questions. Sure. Well, it has a very cool cover that is like, you know, that's kind of like the gimmicky part of it. Although it's also available on Audible. And if you knew the lengths I, I, I went, not to sound like a martyr here, uh, in the middle of a global pandemic to basically create a professional sound studio so I didn't have to go anywhere to create the Audible, you, you would probably get the Audible because I think it actually turned out really well. But if you're, if you're an old fashioned like me and you like to just read, um, you can go to Amazon, you can go anywhere and you can go to bookshop, you can go to your local bookstore and ask for it, um, Barnes and Noble, BAM, anywhere. Um, there's a website, smokescreenbook.com. You can buy it from a retailer there or just wherever you would normally get it. Um, you know, I think we, we've touched on a lot of the, of the issues, um, but again, I think that sometimes it's the stories that, that move people and change people. And again, that was the motivation. I didn't wanna just write a statistical manual about marijuana, which is desperately needed. And there, you know, there's, some, there's stuff that's out there and it could always be improved, but that really wasn't the, the purpose of this. And, and I'm, by the way, I should mention, I'm honored to have had Patrick um, Kennedy again, write the foreword and he's just done so much tireless work. He's a huge fan of the partnership to end addiction as well. And big partner of all of yours and, um, and, you know, supports all of us in this effort. So yeah, check it out. If you want to uh, organize any community meetings, if you want to organize a book event, if you want to organize, you know, anything you want virtual um, at this point, uh, please let us know. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And, um, you know, and thank you for that plug, Kev, um, for us. I mean, uh, Linda, you know, we have these, we're trying to have these conversations and share this information with, with parents and schools and communities. Um, what can people do to learn more about our resources and our services? Yes, yeah, so, you know, just about all the resources we have um, that can be accessed on our website are for parents. But one of our most requested resources is our Marijuana Talk Kit which guides parents through many of the scenarios and provides truly helpful tips on how to talk with kids and how to listen um, about marijuana. But what's interesting and timely is that if you go to our homepage today, drugfree.org, you'll see that the main entry is our brand new set of resources for parents that offer guidance on everything they need to know to protect children, teens, and young adults from the risks of marijuana use. And we have parallel sets of resources for school, for educators, and for health professionals. Um, it's also important to point out that one of the main reasons parents reach out to our family support services, including our Help and Hope by Text messaging program and our helpline and our parent coaching, is because they're concerned about a loved one's marijuana use. Um, people think it's about opioids, but marijuana is the number one drug that people come to us for. Um, and our personalized support services are really terrific and extremely helpful to families who might just have some questions about how concerned they should be about a kid who may not even have tried marijuana yet, all the way to a parent who needs support to help a loved one who is either in treatment or recovering from a marijuana use disorder or struggling. Um, and finally, I'll just give a plug for a future project, which Kevin, we'd love your help with. Um, regarding legalization, as you said before, you know we can't have our eyes closed to this and as more states legalize, we wanna be in the conversation um, about how to protect kids. So. What we'd like to do is really document what different state laws are doing in terms of uh, protections for kids in theory and in practice um, and evaluating those against a series of precautions that we know states should be taking to protect kids in the face of legalization. Um, and we hope to share these uh, findings with parents and the public, kind of hoping that a knowledgeable public will be better equipped to advocate for their kids' health when it comes to new state ballot initiatives related to legalization, or even if it's been legalized already to push for reforms of existing provisions that will fall, sh fall short of what we need. Thanks, Linda. Um, Thanks. Marcia, you to, uh, Marcia or Liz, I think we have, uh, we, we have time for some questions. Do you want to share a few? Yeah, there's been some um, great conversation happening in the chat and um, some of the issues have already been touched on, but, but one that I don't think we spent a lot of time on was medical marijuana. Um, and wondering if that's a slippery slope or if there's a safe place for it. Can you guys comment on that? 
Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start and then I'd love to hear everybody. You know, there's medical marijuana and there's medical marijuana. <laughs> um, and so, you know, th there are components of marijuana that have proven medical value. And that's that's helpful. That goes through the FDA. We have FDA approved medications. Um, you know, we, we, we I happen to think medications should go through some scientific standard. Uh, I certainly don't think we should, you know, vote on the coronavirus vaccine. I mean, imagine if we voted on which COVID-19 vaccine that we should take as a society. It'd be the it'd be the the company with the most advertising dollars would win, right? So I I, I hesitate and wince when I hear about medical marijuana being voted on rather than going through the scientific process. So that's the political side of it. The scientific side of it is that there are components, um, th you know, THC in a synthetic form, Marinol, as well as CBD in a specific formulation called um, Epidiolex, which are approved by the FDA, used for very specific illnesses. And I have no problem with that. And frankly, and this might be controversial, I mean, if you have six months to live and, and you're dying of terminal cancer, I, I don't really care what you take, frankly, whether, whether it's marijuana or whatever. That's not what the policy discussion is about. The policy discussion, I think, for us is, does it make sense to essentially allow anyone over 18 with a pulse who claims to have a headache to get marijuana, you know, from a non-medical professional um, and get high potency strains that are going to mess up their brain. I mean, that's the question for us. And, and that doesn't mean, again, there aren't medical, there aren't medical um, properties, as I mentioned, but we really have to define what we mean, just like we do with legalization when we talk about the term medical marijuana, because there's valid medical marijuana, I think, going through the FDA, certain end of life circumstances, and there's really invalid medical marijuana, which is voter approved in legislatures. It's a polit it becomes political. It doesn't become scientific. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would just argue um, that, you know, again, this is one of those sort of hazy areas where the industry really benefited from. And, and they understood early on that by kind of starting off with the medical marijuana debate, um, it kind of eased the way into recreational marijuana legalization. Um, because it changed perceptions like, oh, wow, marijuana can yeah. cure medical problems. Okay, then it can't be that bad. And, and then it just kind of grew from there. So it was a really smart move. Well, and, and, and actually, if I can say in the book, um, I actually, this is a point we didn't talk about. So this, this question is, is, is helpful too, tangentially uh, to this. I talk about the movement to normalize marijuana and what that political movement looked like, what tactics they took what they did. And one of the first things they did in 1979 was to say that they were going to legalize medical marijuana as a red herring to give marijuana a good name. That's a direct quote in a newspaper, so it can never be disputed. Um, and uh, it was documented. And that was the head of the marijuana movement then saying they would be using it. And they, frankly, they did. I mean, they did a great job of using it as a red herring because they did something to mess with our permission structure with marijuana. We used to think marijuana was, was really not good. And then we all of a sudden, as Linda implied, we got the permission to say that, you know, it may be in these circles, maybe it's okay for medicine. And then that eventually led to where we're at now, which is, you know, you have a hard time convincing anybody that marijuana is harmful, even though we have all the statistics and we have all the science and every single major scientific group in this country and abroad, you know, believes what we're saying, you know, not believes they are, they, they agree with what I'm saying right now. And yet the average person doesn't because the average person thinks they used it, they're fine. It's not addictive and it's medicine. So it was really a brilliant strategy that I tried to document here. You know, talk about a slippery slope toward normalization, right? From, from that initial Absolutely. Sort of permission, right? That's interesting. Um, Absolutely. Any other, other questions? Yeah, Julie has a great question. Um, after legalization has happened, what are some successful policy strategies you've seen community coalitions such as DFC coalitions um, use to influence uh, and, and reduce harm? Who wants to take that? I'm happy to, but Linda, if you would like to get, get in there. Go ahead, Kevin. I know you had a lot of experience in New Jersey, Colorado. 
Yeah, you know, in New Jersey, New York as well. In fact, we're going to, um, I, I know, Julie, you're part of this. We're going to have a, a meeting in a couple of weeks to talk about the opt-out strategy. Because first of all, in most places, you can opt out of legal marijuana in your community. And I'm not sure how many of you knew this on here, but the majority of cities and towns and villages in states that have legalized marijuana, the majority of cities and towns and villages have banned the sales of marijuana. They don't allow it. So even on the state level, they voted for it. On the local level, they don't. I mean, you have counties that voted for legalization 60 to 40. And then when they vote on whether or not they should have a pot shop in their community, it loses the, it flips the other way, which is a dramatic change in politics. It was 40 to 60. And, and, and that is um, because people understand the science actually on this part of it, that, you know, it, it, because it, it fits with their common sense, that living near a pot shop isn't going to be good for any community. I mean, it doesn't going to lift anybody up. It's not going to help them. And so, um, so, so, you know, that one thing is the opt out. The other thing is to, is to keep educating, you know, a lot of people, and I'm really glad this question um, was asked so I could say this, I would have, I would have been upset at myself if I didn't mention this. A lot of people think game over if it's legalized, like we just need to go home and we're done. We lost, we lost the battle, you know, we're, we're we got to go home. That's not a, what it's about at all. The battle, as you all know, is for hearts and minds. The battle is about education. The battle is about doing things like we did with tobacco that we couldn't have dreamed of doing 30 years ago. Banning smoking while we fly, banning smoking in restaurants, banning it in public places, age 21 in, in, in a lot of states, banning all flavors. These things, the anti-tobacco movements tried to do in the 1930s and 40s, and they failed, but they set a foundation so that 60 years later, when our country finally woke up after we were you know, slaughtered by this industry, realizing they weren't our friends, we woke up and said, you know what? Those people were right who said that 80 years ago, we should implement that. And so that's what we are, folks. I mean, I don't care if we legalize marijuana tomorrow in every country in the world, or if it takes 10 more years to get two more countries. We have to keep educating, keep talking about the science, keep inspiring people to, you know, be raised up to, to think about hope. And that is how that's our job. It's not, you know, whether a policy wins go here or there. Of course, certain policies make our jobs harder. If we legalized heroin tomorrow, our job becomes harder. There's no doubt about it. But it doesn't become irrelevant. It becomes more relevant. Same thing with marijuana. It, we don't become irrelevant. We become more relevant. And um, the other tidbit I will just say is don't forget it's about marijuana today and it's about all drugs tomorrow. This movement does not end with marijuana. There's way more money in cocaine and heroin. I promise you that is next. We're already hearing about it from you know trendy professors and others talking about how they use drugs and everyone should and we should legalize and regulate them and teach people how to use heroin correctly. This is the next frontier and we have to be ready for it. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but I, I wanted those to say those two points earlier and I, I finally got to say that. It, it was a, um, it was, it was, I think, you know, the thought I had is, is, is that, is that the point we're going to end on or, or Marshall, let me just ask you real quick if, if there's any other questions you want to ask, I think we maybe have time for one, uh, but I, but I thought Kevin, that was a very, if, if a we have yeah, maybe a really quick answer to this question. It's, it, it's a, it's a good one. Um, about agreeing with the commercialization issues of the cannabis industry, but, but saying there's a long history of reactionary drug policy in the United States that has caused harm. And how do you think that impacts the current conversation? Well, it, it definitely impacts the current. There is a long history of that. I'm not denying that. I mean, you know, if, if uh, we have a history in our country of all policies, especially those centered in the criminal justice system that have origins in very, very dark racist places that I'm not, you know, would never support. That being said, there are things I think we can do to change that that won't make the issue worse. Because again, the people who are going to suffer from more drugs being commercialized and available are not people, again, that look like me and you. Because you know what? Or any of the three of us, I should say. Because we have resources, we'll get help, we'll get good legal counsel. We, 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 we won't be touched as much, okay? And this, again, may be controversial, but I, I believe it. It is the people that already are dealt a really bad hand in life that are trying to raise themselves up. Those are the ones that are disproportionately affected by policies like legalization. And so 
no doubt reactionary drug policies that have caused harm. Absolutely, those need to change. You know, but we don't need to go from one extreme, you could argue, of a reactionary to a total opposite extreme of opening the floodgates. And you know, again, you could argue, well, could we do it in a safer way? You know, there's a discussion to be had there, and, and it's too long for right now. But 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 we don't want to go from one extreme to the other. Um, Marcia, any any other questions, or is, is it sort of a, was that a good one to end on? I think. I think that might be a good one to end on. Look, just right. looking at the clock. Yeah, no, it's been a full hour, and as usual, the you know hour flew by um, because we're talking about a lot of important things here. I want to, uh, I mean, it, Kevin and Lynn, I want to thank you in a second, but let me just first, I want to thank um, everyone for joining us, and I um, I, I think uh, for those, it looks like a few people may have. I don't know if we had a, a time zone issue, but for those who maybe joined late. Um, Marcia, we will have a recording of this available. Is that, is that right? Um, we will. Um, we can send around a, a link to that and, and we'll share it uh, with the larger partnership audience as well. Yeah, and so many of you are already part of our, our community partners network and, and all of you, I'm sure you care a lot about this issue and issues of addiction and mental health. And so we would invite you if you wanna get more involved in our work to please do so. Um, Liz, I think has shared a, a um, or, or can share a link, to, you know, go to our website drugfree.org to learn more about how you can get involved with us. And um, this is the work we do in bringing information and education and helping all of us to play um, an important part in this work, you know, in our families, in our communities, in our country is so important. And uh, Dr. Sabet and Dr. Richter, Kevin and Linda, you've helped us uh, uh, take a big step forward on that today. And so thank you to both of you. And uh, I think everyone is applauding right now. And one of the comments I saw was that the Dr. Fauci of, um, of marijuana, Kevin, I think we'll give to you. Uh, it depends. It de <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. He's a, he's a great guy. I, I saw that. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't take that. I won't take that comparison. He's dealing with something. Yeah, a lot bigger, but, uh, but, but both you. of you are, are <laughs> just so, so smart and thoughtful and on this issue. And just so thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate it. And we appreciate all of you. Uh, and let's thank stay you. in touch and connect with each other. And Kevin, good luck. Absolutely. Well, thanks to the partnership for hosting this uh, about Smokescreen. I want to thank Linda. It's great. And thank you. Uh, Liz, Marsha, everybody, uh, and everyone who was on. I put my email in the chat. If you want to contact me, please do. Um, let's work together. There, there's a lot that needs to be done. And, and, you know, only a few people that are willing to stand up right now, you know, in, in the face of this. And uh, even though, you know, we have the science. So let's, let's work together and, and make a difference. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And we'll, we'll see everyone soon. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.